welcome to episode 29 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabelski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. When I'm not doing stuff for Medievalist.net or recording a podcast for you, sometimes I'm teaching at community college. And over the last decade, I've been teaching in different departments at different colleges. And one of the places where I've been teaching was an academic upgrading program. And this is a program for people who had left high school, maybe didn't get their diplomas, or maybe it's been a while since they got their diplomas and they have to upgrade their skills before they start their community college work. And in that, I would teach communications And I'd be teaching people kind of basic English. And a lot of the people who are in that kind of a program are people who are coming at English as ESL or people who have a learning disability. For them, learning English is really, really difficult. And a lot of people, when they're learning or relearning English, feel like it's them. But the problem is not with them. English is a really, really strange language. So one of the things I would do would be to put together a short class on why English is so weird. So today's podcast is going to be kind of like this class, why English is such a weird language, because that's based a lot in medieval history. So why is English so weird? Well, once upon a time, there was an island and it was full of Celts, Picts, and Britons. And they're called Britons because the Romans had come up when they were conquering their empire and they had named it Britannia. And that's of course what gives us the word Britain when we're talking about this island. So Britain is a happy place full of Celts, Picts, Britons. And then in the early Middle Ages, it starts to be invaded. Well, when has it not been invaded really? But it starts to be invaded from the east. And it's invaded by people from Jutland, from Angeln, and from Saxony especially. And so these different peoples are invading and invading and invading and deciding to stay and start to take over. So eventually the Roman Empire sort of recedes and there are so many people who are coming over from Angeln and from Saxony that this island starts to become Angled land. Um, And of course, as Many people who are learning English know, especially people who are learning English as a second language, know English speakers are very lazy in how we pronounce things. So instead of Angoland, it's called England. And the language that people were speaking at this time is what we now call Anglo-Saxon or Old English. So Old English is actually kind of a distinct language, a language on its own that is different from modern English. There's a whole bunch of things about it that are different. So if you were to pick up a copy of Beowulf in Old English or Anglo-Saxon, you would not necessarily be able to read it unless you had a universal translator from Star Trek or something because the, the language is extremely different, not only the forms of the words, but how you'd pronounce the words. Linguists who know a lot more about this stuff than I do have kind of taken a stab at how this would actually sound. And so I will take a stab at this as well. No laughing, um, unless you can do it better than I can. In which case, feel free to record yourselves and send me the recording. So when I think about Old English and and how you pronounce it, it has this kind of beautiful sound to it. I think about Beowulf, and if you know a little bit about the story of Beowulf, you know that it's kind of creepy. There is a monster that is coming to a mead hall at night, and it's attacking the people who are inside it. Beowulf is written in a way that a lot of Anglo-Saxon poems are, which is that they have a lot of alliteration, so a lot of the same sounds on each line. So it doesn't rhyme like Dr. Seuss. It does have pauses in the middle of each line, and it has alliteration in it, so you can hear um, a lot of the same sounds. So I'm going to take a stab at it. This is one of, uh, one of the lines that I find nice and creepy from Beowulf. Beowulf. I'm going to try and say it the way I was taught Old English sounds. So here we go. So the line is Come on one renicht skrithen sha du genga. So that sounds pretty creepy, I think. Or maybe just strange. <laughs> so imagine listening, you're sitting around a fire and you hear not what sounds like modern English, but you hear this line. And that is a line from Beowulf, which says, in modern English, in the dark night he came creeping, the shadow goer. I love this poem. It's very, very creepy, especially if you read it in Old English. So instead of a word just like 
creepy monster, you have something beautiful like Shadow Ganga, which is the shadow goer. And a couple of weeks ago, I recommended Roy Liuza's translation of that. And that is because he has these beautiful two part words together that are so descriptive that really make Beowulf sort of stand out in my mind. If you heard common Shadowganga, you're not going to think, oh, they're speaking English. And this is kind of what I'm trying to get at. Old English or Anglo Saxon is extremely different from modern English. And it's very, very different from Shakespeare's English too, which you're going to get to. Old English is a dead language. Nobody walks around speaking it anymore. So how did people figure out what these words actually meant? And, and this is kind of interesting. One of the ways in which people figured out what Old English was, what the words were, is kind of working backwards from school books where people had written words in Anglo-Saxon and they'd glossed them in Latin. So Latin's dead language, but we've known it for a really long time, continuously. And so people could go and read the Latin that was translated over top of the Anglo-Saxon or Old English. And that's how they figured out what these words were. Now, I don't know how they figured out what these words sounded like. I think it has a lot to do with how rhymes, etc., were structured, but you'll have to speak to a linguist about that. So one of the things that I really found exciting when I first learned uh, a bit of Old English and Middle English as well, which we'll get to, is that English back in the day had five letters, which it doesn't have today. So those five letters are ash, which looks like the A-E in Caesar, and that sounded like ah, like cat. Then there was thorn, which makes a T-H sound like th, like thorn. Then there was F which also makes kind of a TH sound, but you'd often find it at the end of a word like broth. And then there was win, which makes a W sound like winter. And you'd see this at the beginning of a word and often it looks like a P. And the first thing that you do when you start to translate old or middle English is you, you assume this is a P and you have to unlearn and learn that it's a win instead. And then the last one is yoke, which sounds like like uh, the Scottish loch, kind of a h -h sound, and, and that's yog. So there were five letters that English doesn't have today that it had back in the day. People didn't use W's, which we do now, or Z's back in Old English. But uh, I think it's very, very interesting that we had different letters in English back in the day. And I'd really like to bring them back. If you use Word, you can find these letter forms and you can actually stick them into your documents, which I know that all of us medievalists would like to find a shortcut, a universal shortcut, or have it on the keyboard. But for now, you can just go to the symbols in Word and you can find these both as small letters and as capital letters. So the other thing that makes Old English or Anglo-Saxon interesting is that you pronounce some of the vowels differently. So when I was learning Old English and Middle English, the rule was French vowels, English consonants. So you'd pronounce every consonant in a word and you would pronounce the vowels in a way that was more French. So if you had the word knight, as in knights on a horse, back in the day they would have spelled it K-N-I, yoke, T, and you'd pronounce it knicht. So when you see Monty Python and the Holy Grail and they talk about silly English knichts, that's because that's how you would have said it back in the day. And the people in Monty Python, they knew that. So you'd have a word like knicht, and that was the word night. And there's a reason that that changed, um, that it's pronounced differently, which we will get to soon. Next time you go to something or see something that says ye old English, whatever, you will now know, when you look at it carefully, that it is actually a thorn that was misread into a Y. So thorn, E, Old English, is the Old English, like the Old English tourist trap or the Old English beer. It's thorn, not a Y. So that is kind of Anglo-Saxon in a nutshell. So we all know what happened. People were speaking Anglo-Saxon happily, in Britain and what happened well 1066 happened and in 1066 we all know William the Bastard came over from Normandy and changed his name to William the Conqueror he took over England and all of a sudden all the important people were not speaking 
Anglo-Saxon, the conquerors were speaking Norman French. And if you look at Robin Hood stories, they often have, you know, a century or so later, Normans who are ruling and Saxons as peasants. And this is kind of how things worked out. The people who were at the top of the social sphere, they were speaking Norman French. The people underneath were speaking Anglo-Saxon or English. And this was the case for hundreds of years. You'd have the king who was speaking Norman French and the commoners who were speaking English. This is true for all sorts of really famous English kings like Richard the Lionheart, who probably didn't speak English, but he did speak French, um, especially the type of French that they spoke in Southern France. So at this time, English was not the language of the cool kids. It was definitely the language of the peasant folk. Now, if you've ever looked at different languages, if you've ever looked at German and you've ever looked at French, you'll notice that the rules for creating sentences, words in German and French are completely different. And this is because they come from different language families. So Germanic languages have different rules for how they structure verbs, nouns, all sorts of parts of speech. Um, and French has different ways of creating different parts of speech, sentences, and all that stuff. French is a romance language, like Italian, like Spanish, like Portuguese. And romance, in this case, doesn't mean kissing and all of those bodice-ripping <laughs> novels that we all love. It, it means a Roman language. So French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, you probably already know, they're derived from Latin, and so they follow those rules. Now, why am I bringing this up? Why do we care if it's romantic or not? Well, English started to change, and it started to take on words from two different language families, which means that the way that we put words together, sentences together, started to follow the rules of two different languages. And that is why it can be very difficult to sometimes know what form of the verb you want to use because it might be following Germanic rules and it might be following Romance rules. And you can't always tell just by looking at it what kind of a word it is. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you can still see the rem remnants of this sort of social strata in our language today. And that is that a lot of the words that are common words, words that we use kind of every day for important but not luxurious things, these are Anglo-Saxon words or they're derived from Anglo-Saxon. And a lot of the words that we use that mean something fancy are derived from French. So what do I mean by this? I mean, if you look at sort of the modern equivalents, for example, the word brot in German, brot. I know I, I can't pronounce German very well. I just took one course in high school. Give me a break. Uh, brot is bread, right? Sounds kind of similar, but that's not the French word for it. That's a Germanic word. Um, the word for house is similar. In German, it's house. The word for king, which is a word that people had, obviously, before the Norman conquest. In Anglo-Saxon, it's kerning. In French, we have fancier words. So if you wanted to talk about a pig, for example, um, you might talk about a schwein, uh, a swine. But if you're talking about the food, you'd talk about pork, right? Which is related to the French word pork. Uh, or beef, so not the actual animal, but the food, boeuf in French. So these are similar. You can see this more if you look at um, house, for example, which is derived from Anglo-Saxon, Germanic word, and the word palace, which comes from French. So words like house, Anglo-Saxon, mansion, French. So we can still see there's a division between the words of the common people and the words of the wealthy in our language today. And I find that fascinating. So now, now that you know, perhaps you'll dig through the dictionary and find what common words do we use every day that come from Anglo-Saxon and what fancy words do we use that come from Latin or French. The point of all of this being that we have a layer of Anglo-Saxon. On top of that, we have a layer of French. And on top of that is Latin, because we all know that the people who were educated in the Middle Ages were speaking Latin. So there were three different languages that were cycling around England, mixing together, mixing their rules, mixing their pronunciations. And that's Anglo-Saxon, Norman French, and Latin. So when I think about English 
Like, how do you describe English to someone? Like, it's such a strange language. What is it like? I think of a platypus. So when I'm teaching, I teach English and I say, well, you know, we have these two different things. They go together. They're like a platypus. It's sort of a duck and it's sort of a beaver. But you know what? When you put it together, it's awfully cute and precious the way it is. And that is what English is like to me. It's a platypus. To make things extra complicated, English, as we know, like many, many other languages, if not all other languages, has different dialects based on where you're from. So this is definitely the case in the Middle Ages when people were traveling, but not as much as they are today. There is no, there was no overarching style of speech that was spread through television or radio or anything like that. It was very, very regional. And so when you think about it in terms of English, there's all sorts of different platypuses all over England. And speaking of English being weird, you can't actually pluralize platypus by saying platypuses or platypi. It's actually Greek. Platypides, I think, is how you say it correctly. So there's English being amazing again. And just as kind of an interesting note, one of the people that taught us all about the different dialects in English, where they're from based on spellings, based on pronunciation, is our favorite uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. He uh, was really deeply into language and it's thanks to him that we really have a good idea of what type of dialect people had in different places. Now, he's not the only one that worked on this. Uh, definitely other people worked on it as well. But this is kind of an interesting bit of trivia. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien really contributed a lot to what we know about the dialects in English in the Middle Ages. So in the first century or two after 1066, it is not the cool kids that are speaking English, but that does change over time. And it changes especially because the English start to have more and more continuing feuds with France, especially the Hundred Years' War. So it's difficult for English to say we are better than France when all of the elite people are actually speaking French. So as the Hundred Years' War develops, as it goes on, English starts to be the language spoken by the people at the top, kind of for the first time. And so Richard II, we know at the end of the 14th century, uh, Richard is speaking English. And Richard, for all of his faults, was somebody who really encouraged English. And he encouraged English through one of, you know, the quote-unquote fathers of English literature by encouraging Geoffrey Chaucer. Now, you might have seen a manuscript image. It's absolutely beautiful. It's got Chaucer speaking at a pulpit and uh, Richard II and John of Gaunt and a few other really important people listening to Chaucer. That is probably something that never happened, but... Regardless, Chaucer was writing in the 14th century. He was familiar with the nobles. They were familiar with his work. And so Chaucer was one of the people who, whether you like the Canterbury Tales or not, he was one of the people that really made English cool. For me, it's the Gawain poet. He was writing, we think, at around the same time in a different dialect from a different part of England. Um, and he was another person who was writing in English for an audience that was more likely to be listening in English or reading it in English. So English started to be the language of poets in the 14th century especially. So I'm going to make another attempt to try and to lay this out for you. Again, apologies, my pronunciation may not be amazing, but I'm going to take a stab at it. So if we take Chaucer, it sounds and is spelled a lot more like English is today. Now again, it's not modern English. It's not Shakespeare's English, which I will get to in a second. It's not Old English. It is Middle English, which is again a very distinct language. And you can read stuff in Middle English that looks a lot like modern English, or you can read stuff in Middle English that looks like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is a bit more obscure and difficult to read. It still has many of those letter forms that are from Old English, so those five letters that we don't have today, those still appear in Middle English and they're going to disappear soon. Part of the reason is that they don't appear in much of Chaucer's work and I'm going to get to why that's important in a second. Okay, so I'm going to take a stab at Chaucer's English for a minute. Again, no laughing unless you can do it better than me, in which case I'd be happy to have you on the podcast. 
to show me up. Okay, so if we take the first couple lines of Chaucer, of the Canterbury Tales, it sound, should sound something like this. One that April with his shoulders sota, the draught of March hath pierced to the rota. And in modern English that comes out as one that April with his showers sweet, the drought of March has pierced to the root. So that's Chaucer for you. It sounds different. It's Middle English, so it sounds different from Modern English. It is spelled differently from Modern English, but not too differently. And sometimes it will have those letter forms in it that we talked about earlier. Now, I was going to say why it's really important that we pay attention to Chaucer's language in terms of why English is so weird. And one of the reasons is because when the printing press arrived, in England in the 15th century, William Caxton um, had the printing press in England in 1476. One of the first things he published was the Canterbury Tales. And so one of the first things that is published and available in huge numbers of copies is Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. And so Chaucer in a very real way sort of solidified English for us, some of the spellings, um, some of the words he used, they started to kind of crystallize into proper English, the English that we use today, because Caxton enjoyed the Canterbury Tales so much and, and he published it first and allowed it to be distributed much more widely than something like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So if Caxton had set up his printing press for the North in England, perhaps we would all be spelling things like the Gawain poet, who's to say? But because of this, we have kind of the form of English that is more familiar to us today in many ways because of London English. So the type of English, the dialect that Chaucer was writing in that people were speaking in at the time. So Caxton's got the printing press. He has it set up in the late 15th century and he starts to print things, all sorts of things, really fabulous things. One of these things is, of course, the Bible. One is Canterbury Tales and one is Mallory's Mort d'Arthur. So an amazing range of things Caxton is printing. The printing press is responsible for another really cool bit of trivia. And that is when people were setting up the printing press and they had the letter forms to take out and put on the printing press before they laid the paper down. These small letters that we use for everything um, were on a lower tray and the capital letters that we use were on an upper tray. And if you look at these images, woodcuts of these, you'll see uppercase letters and lowercase letters. And that is where we get uppercase and lowercase from, it comes from the printing press. So English continued to evolve and it evolved taking things from all over the place because as we know, people started to expand. They started to colonize from England, different places in the world and started to take more bits from different languages and integrate them into English. So another place where we start to see English getting to change and solidify is in the time of King James. So King James the first of England, he's King James VI, I believe, of Scotland, he was the heir to the throne of Elizabeth I. King James's contribution to the English language is, of course, the King James Bible, which he oversaw. Now, I haven't gone deeply into this myself, but medievalists might find interesting that some people have noticed that some of the phrases used in the King James Bible are similar to the Bible that was created by John Wycliffe in the 14th century. Again, this is something I'd encourage you to look up, but it's not something I know well, and of course, we know at the time of Queen Elizabeth and King James, there is the most famous writer in English writing plays for the London stage. And that is, of course, Christopher Marlowe. Just kidding. Of course, it's not. It's William Shakespeare. And William Shakespeare's plays are hugely influential and very, very interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, he wrote and co-wrote a bunch of them. So those words that he has um, were co-written by other people. Also, his plays were mostly not published until he had been dead for seven years. So some of his plays came out in quarto edition. People were sitting in the playhouse writing down his words. And some of them came out from actors remembering his words 
years later. So a lot of things that are uh, attributed to Shakespeare, well, you kind of wonder whether these are the exact words that he had written in the first place. I love Shakespeare. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not one of those people who thinks his plays were written by somebody else. I think this is the guy, the swan of Avon that wrote them. So a lot of words and phrases are attributed to Shakespeare that are probably much older. We tend to discover more and more of these phrases that we'd said, oh, Shakespeare coined. We'll find them as we find more evidence of, of medieval manuscripts. So a lot of things that he had heard and were solidified in his writing, some of them he made up out of his own head. Some of them he didn't. So some of these words are excellent, fashionable phrases like, I've been eaten out of house and home, or I've seen better days. A lot of these are attributed to Shakespeare. Now, the thing that you need to know about Shakespeare is he is speaking, or he was speaking, modern English. I know that nobody is going to believe you. Send them to this podcast so I can tell them Shakespeare's writing in modern English, not old English. We know that that sounds really creepy and amazing, like Beowulf. It's not Middle English, the English of Jocer. It is modern English. And modern English is distinct because it does not have those old letter forms in it. The spelling is a lot more like it is today. In Shakespeare's time, they did use old words that we don't use anymore. They use the and thou, for example. You find them in the King James Bible and people don't use those anymore. But that doesn't mean it's old English. So the next time someone says to you, Shakespeare is speaking old English, you can pull out your copy of Beowulf and you can read them the line about the shadow goer. It's not the same language. So Shakespeare, modern English, now you know. I hope you win at Trivia Night. So of course, Shakespeare's English, I'm not going to attempt to speak it because I understand that it might sound something like a Newfoundland accent and that is one accent that I definitely cannot do. But we know that it was spoken in a way that doesn't sound exactly like modern English does now. And one of the ways that we figure that out is by the rhyming couplets that Shakespeare tends to have at the end of many of his scenes. In order for them to rhyme, you have to actually pull your vowels in a different direction. So after Shakespeare, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because really, this is a medieval podcast. Who cares about the stuff that happened after the Middle Ages or early modern period? But there were lots of different writers who we know and love. Dickens, Austin, the Brontes, Samuel Johnson, who was one of the people who was working on an English dictionary. Probably drove himself absolutely bananas doing that. But, you know, we all get our kicks in different ways. And sometime around that time, there was what is called the Great Vowel Shift. So this is definitely not my period. You'll definitely need to speak to linguists about what happened because I don't know what happened, but people started to move their vowels from one place in their mouth to another. So instead of saying knicht, people started to say night. That I became an I sound. Instead of saying hond, people said hand. Instead of that a, oh, you had an a sound hand and so people start to shift their vowels the great vowel shift i don't know why it happened but it happened and that is why we don't have the same pronunciation that we did even just in shakespeare's day what happened to english after that americans i'm sorry i'm not a big fan of your dear friend noah webster who decided that we needed to drop the u's out of words like neighbor and honor and color as a proud Canadian, I love those U's and I'm going to keep them in there. But Noah Webster was one of the people who contributed to dropping the U's out of words like color, honor, and neighbor when he created his Dictionary of the English Language in 1828. And then since then, English has had all sorts of different changes. It made its way across the airwaves through telephones and radio and t television. People are starting to flatten out their accents in ways that they didn't before. Accents used to be very, very regional, and now they, they have a bigger geographical area to them, and this has to do with the way we communicate. And of course, the computer, the internet, that changed how we communicate with people. And I did take a course on the history of the English language when I was in university. My professor was the amazing Sarah Lerat Kiefer. 
And she was very excited about English in our time because before this period, many of the new words that we'd use in English would be borrowed from other languages because other languages were still seen to be much more hip. They had a certain je ne sais quoi, if you know what I mean. When we wanted to have something sophisticated, we would often borrow from French, even in the early 20th century. Something was chic, for example, or people would go around saying enchanté, right? But now, Professor Kiefer thought it was very exciting because English is starting to create a lot more words, a lot more words than it has at any time since it was Anglo-Saxon. So people are starting to create words or they're starting to reshape words and redefine words. And in some ways, this is very exciting. We now have, instead of electric mail, we have email, that is word. We have words like unfriend, which didn't exist before. <laughs> We have changed the way we use certain words. For example, Google was a word for a number, right? A one with 100 zeros behind it, I believe it was Google. And now, of course, Google it means to search for something. Tweet obviously meant a sound. Tweet is now something that you do. We're starting to use words in different ways. And this is kind of exciting. Uh, it's kind of terrible. I'm one of those people that, that cringes when someone has made up a new word for a word that exists. People who know me know that probably the one that makes me the most crazy is when people make up words that uh, are replacing words that already exist that nobody bothered to understand. Containerization instead of compartmentalization. You know, these buzzwords that people are making up. That really makes me crazy. But I accept it because English has always changed. It's always been on the move and it continues to be on the move. So we do see going into the future, our English is starting to be spelled a lot differently thanks to text messages. It's going to be interesting to see how these things change. Are the short forms that we use like BRB for be right back, is that going to stay? Is that going to change? Is that going to become a word in the future? We don't know. It's very, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be speaking English. But all of these things over the course of history have contributed to why English is such a strange language, why it's so hard to learn. And a lot of this is down to what was done with and to English in the Middle Ages. So next time you are trying to spell a word, whether it's in a spelling bee or for Scrabble, and you're wondering why this sometimes has a U and it sometimes doesn't, just remember that English is weird. It's not just you, but it is a beautiful platypus, all its own, cute and snuggly and a little bit poisonous. Next time, perhaps you will have an appreciation for how English got to be where it is today. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hi, Danielle. Yeah, we uh, had a good week on this website. There's two things I want to tell you about. One is uh, a piece by Kate Stevenson on fabulous medieval book titles. Uh, we all know that book titles uh, are really important to selling a book, and it must have been true in the Middle Ages because there's stuff like the art of party crashing and the <laughs> incoherence of the incoherence. So Kate talks about that and tells you exactly what these little book, these books uh, were. So we have that, and we also have a piece on the saga of John the Playmate. John the Playmate? Yes. So a nice kind of Icelandic, chivalrous saga, and uh, it's by Min uh, Minji Sue talks about it, and it talks about how it goes in uh, unusual ways. So we have that on the website this week for everyone to read. Well, they sound really, really interesting. I'm going to have to check those out. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks. I just finished writing my latest article on the Wars of the Roses for the next issue of Medieval Warfare magazine. Want to read it? Get yourself a paper or digital subscription and support your favorite podcast at the same time by becoming one of our patrons at patreon.com slash medievalists. For more weird and interesting trivia about the medieval world, check out Medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can also follow me, Danielle Sapolsky, all over social media at 5MIN Medievalist. And you can find my books on Amazon. The 5 Minute Medievalist has one article on English words that are also pretty weird. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog.
Thanks for listening to my own weird English every week. Have yourself a great day.